I'm Sunila Abhisekara and I'm from Sri Lanka. I work with a Human Rights Documentation Centre called INFORM that's based in Colombo and I have worked with women's rights and human rights issues now for a very long time, probably 30 years. Um, Sri Lanka is not a secular state in that in the constitution of 1972 we privileged Buddhism and I think that has been the basis for a lot of unhappiness uh, with uh, other ethnic and religious communities and the demand for the constitution not to privilege any particular religion has been a call from all progressive quarters because we are a multi-ethnic and multi-religious country. We have had a war in our country which is based on the on discrimination against minority community, the Tamils. And because of that experience, I think all the people who are in any way progressive and who want democracy and peace in Sri Lanka know that uh, the constitution has to guarantee the secular nature of the state. But I think um, if you look at the history of, uh, of uh, secularism and the discourse on secularism in Sri Lanka, you see that um, in the 1920s and 30s when the uh, anti-colonial movement was strong and when the British were just, you know, leaving the, the region, the left parties took up the call for secularism, but unfortunately, when it was translated into Sinhala, which is the majority language, majority ethnic community in Sri Lanka, it was translated as being unreligious. And I think that created a huge backlash. So there was a resistance to secularism because the, the Socialist Party and the Communist Party did not understand that uh, in a country like Sri Lanka, everybody wants to be religious. I think when you have discussions with people, they're perfectly happy that religion should not have anything to do with the state. But the way that it was originally introduced to Sri Lankan politics as being the concept of being in, in religious or without a religion, I think that has created such a problem for us that even in 2008, it's very hard for us to talk about secularism because we have carry, we are carrying this old baggage. In addition, I think what we have seen happening in maybe the last 20 years as the ethnic conflict has intensified is that there has been, originally the conflict is based on ethnic difference and linguistic difference and geographic difference, right? Because the Tamils are a minority community, they live mostly in the north and the east, they speak, uh, they speak Tamil, which is very different uh, linguistically from Sinhalese and so forth. But there has never been the idea that this is a religious conflict or that this is a conflict based on religion. But in the last maybe 10 years, since the parliamentary elections of um, 1998 and there onwards, we've seen the emergence of a Buddhist Brotherhood, what else can I call it? We have a group of Buddhist monks who call themselves the National Heritage Movement, who ran for elections, got themselves elected into Parliament, and have been the most rabid pro-war uh, political group inside Parliament and outside. And you know, Buddhism is a religion of compassion and tolerance. So it is absolute anathema to Buddhism to have these monks, you know, they're not monks, we don't consider them to be monks, you know, these political fascists wearing the saffron robe, identifying themselves as Buddhist monks, and then, uh, you know, doing this um, anti-war rhetoric. And they have very cleverly managed to link the support, support for the LTTE from various church-based groups in Western Europe who also saying that the LTTE, the Tamil Liberation Struggle, uh, represents all that is Western, imperialist, Christian. So there's a very um, kind of uh, comfortable for them, uncomfortable for us, uh, collapsing of the, of the categories. And so in the last two or three years, we have had a range of attacks on 
small Christian churches. And it's the first time in Sri Lanka since the 1920s that you are seeing this. And uh, Buddhist monks have led attacks against small Christian churches in uh, provincial towns and even in suburbs of the capital, Colombo. You have seen also, for example, within the Muslim community, uh, the, the emergence of Sunni Shia different. And you like, see, when did this happen? You know, because in Sri Lanka we have like a 7% Muslim community and uh, they've never, I mean, they've had their own issues, class, class issues, for example. But uh, this sudden religious division and Muslims attacking Muslims on the basis of religious difference, you know, that we see very clearly linked to the fact that many Muslims in Sri Lanka are going to the West Asian countries for work, men and women, and coming back imbued with some ideas of very extremist Islamic practice. I mean, in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is a country where Muslim women in the 1950s, my generation of Muslim women, never veiled themselves. They played tennis, they played the piano, they did almost everything that we did, right? And uh, now, very visibly for someone like me, I see people, young Muslim women in my son's generation, 25, 26, covering themselves, insisting on their right to cover themselves. And my friends have daughters who are covering themselves and, you know, insisting on adopting a very militant uh, Islamic position. And I think it's a sign of the times. And in a country like Sri Lanka, which has been small, where religious intolerance has never been a big issue in the years since independence, I think a curious mixture of the growth of Islamic uh, extremism in countries outside, the flowing of that influence to Sri Lanka, uh, the ethnic conflict, the, the way that uh, Buddhist monks have entered the political arena, all these things make the discussion about secularism almost impossible. And yet, I think, if you talk with the minority groups, uh, like especially the Muslims, they recognize that in order for them to be treated fairly, you need to have a secular political structure. Yeah, the, the Buddhists are the ones who have a lot to lose, they say, by being secular, because they will then give equal status to minorities. And I think so, bottom line is, it's about pluralism and it's about democracy, and you can have neither of those things if you are not secular. Well, the lack of a secular space and the intrusion of all kinds of religious doctrine into uh, the political space have severe consequences on women. Uh, a best example is that uh, as far back as 1995, uh, women's groups, I mean, women's groups had been asking for decriminalization of abortion for a very long time because our present law means that even if you're a victim of rape or incest, you cannot get an abortion. In 1995, after a lot of lobbying and after bringing really lawyers and doctors on board the discussion, the Ministry of Justice presented a, a, a range of reforms to the Penal Code and one of them was about the abortion uh, law. And in the parliament, it was the most amazing thing to see Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, everybody get up and say abortion should not be decriminalized because if you have abortion, women will just go around and behave badly. And then, you know, it was all about women's behavior. And I think that was very shocking for us to see how easily and quickly all the religions emerged to deny women one of the things that we consider to be a basic right. In addition, in the last five or six years, we have been seeing in each community growing a kind of a, a very, um, it's, it's very subtle in the beginning because it starts off with imposing dress codes and uh, behavior on women. So in the University of Colombo, a group of single extremists said women should not wear long skirts that have a slit up to their, uh, you know, they were, the slit was only up to their knee, but they said that this is very sexy and provocative. Women, single these women shouldn't be wearing such clothes. Um, and they actually ran around with blades and slit women's skirts to the point that girls were left half naked on the campus. And uh, 
Yeah. In the same way, young Muslim women attending University of Colombo have been forbidden by their male colleagues to stand in line with men in the canteen. So if a Muslim girl wants to eat something in the canteen, she has to stand until she sees a Muslim brother and ask the Muslim brother to buy her food for her. Uh, you know, it, it's just like amazing stories that we hear in the eastern province. Young Tamil women, have, well, there was a big campaign calling on them to leave work in the NGOs and um, they have been forbidden to ride in a vehicle with, uh, you know, with a driver or a male colleague uh, or to travel outside the district to come to Colombo because, you know, NGOs do workshops, trainings, we organize many activities in Colombo and we invite women from the eastern province to come and it's an overnight, it's an overnight stay for sure because it's quite far. So they cannot come anymore because they have been forbidden. So there's no law but it's this pressure of bullies, you know, extremist bullies in every single community and family concerns for, because the families condone this by not supporting the girls when they want to resist and not speaking out and saying, you know, we want our daughters to work, we want our daughters to go to university, we believe that our daughters uh, should be able to wear what they like, you know. We believe our daughters should be able to get their food, I mean, like, you know, that is such an absurd situation. But across the board, no matter what religion you belong to, you find, a, you know, it's creeping in, in the private sphere, in these simple things about how do women dress, how do they behave, and it's very pervasive. No, the state does not care. The state, I think, is perfectly happy to let these kinds of extremist behaviors prevail because, in a way, the community polices itself. And I think that leaves the state free to fight the big war that they're fighting with the LTTE. And I think in the, in the government now we have very many conservative people, especially when it comes to women's issues. So, no, the Sri Lankan state is not interested. In fact, it is complicit by being silent because all these acts are in direct contravention to our constitution that guarantees equality for women. Women's organizations <laughs> always talk about peace and democracy and pluralism and power sharing on the basis that it has to be a secular state. We think that that's a, I, I don't know, we have uh, really felt that this is a strong incursion on, you know, people's right to decide on the freedom of expression and uh, we do hope that there is a better discussion because we know that within the UN now also the extremist and nationalist and chauvinist forces are in power. So it is no surprise to us that such a declaration can come from the UN. Right? But uh, in terms of our own understanding and resistance to this declaration, I think we have to be very strategic and act collectively. And we're really hoping that there'll be a collective feminist women's space to talk about resistance to these kinds of ideas. One of the big issues, I think, uh, about this kind of uh, capturing of political space by religious extremists is that it has a very particular impact on sexual rights and on reproductive rights. I spoke about abortion, but simply also in terms of something like access to contraceptives. Uh, from the eastern province again. We have been hearing many different stories about uh, Muslim women who are denied access to any kind of uh, uh, gynecological or obstetric uh, health services by their families, by their communities. And um, uh, women who go to, you know, Muslim women tend to go to Muslim women doctors and there are very few of them working. And they, those women doctors come under a lot of pressure from families and communities to remain silent even in a case of incest, you know, not to talk about it to the families, not to, you know, try and get the girls some support and help. So I think um, there's, there's been uh, a range of attacks on clinics that provide contraceptive services to women across the board again, not Muslims, Sinhalese in the south, in Colombo, uh, some clinics in the free trade zone areas where there are many women who are working in garment factories actually closed down 
uh, because uh, of these attacks and uh, it's interesting in the in the newspapers you know you see a slew of articles against abortion and some of them are very clearly coming from the Catholic Church funded by uh, Catholic groups um, but it has an impact on non-Catholics because we are a, a, a multi-religious and multicultural country um, in the same way the space to talk about sexual rights issues um, is shrinking because of the fear because um, of the pervasive presence of the military on the streets in most of the big cities the ways in which um, uh, especially gay men because they're the ones who inhabit the public spaces you know they get harassed and attacked and subjected to violence and the ways in which lesbian women uh, who n almost never occupy the public space but uh, live and have their relationships in private space are also finding that that private space is shrinking the space for just women to go out together to the films or to have tea with their friends all these things are shrinking because on the one hand there's a high level of uh, insecurity in general and then families are policing women much more so all the spaces in which women could play a bit all that's shrinking